the presenter of the second keynote address at the 2016 NAT conference is no any other person than our own Maria Erickson Bass. Uh, I'm going to say a few words later about her. And uh, the discussion is another intellectual giant in her respect, uh, Dr. Angela Murumba Sestrom. And both are my colleagues uh, at the Nordic Africa Institute. In the case of uh, Maria Bass, she has double or multiple affiliations. <laughs> uh, Maria uh, brings to the table wealth of experience uh, as a researcher, and I'm quite uh, 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 proud, uh, both as a colleague and even uh, representing the Nordic Africa Institute. Before I proceed further, uh, hear this. Being a researcher and doing in-depth analysis of something you are curious about is a true privilege. Of course, often the findings and conclusions are not very surprising. Yet, sometimes the data you collect go in a very different way than you anticipated. That was Maria. And uh, with that, uh, uh, we are looking forward to a very uh, productive engagement with the topic assumptions, desire on gender in Africa. And uh, Maria has been in this area for quite a while and has even established her name among other intellectual giants. I recall that one of her a book, Sexual Violence as Weapon of War, is indeed an award-winning bestseller. I think we will clap for that. Uh, that is among so many other uh, lawyers that has come uh, her way. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, do I have the pleasure to represent you at this platform and present to you uh, another of our own. Maria Bass, you are welcome. Let's see, you hear me now? Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for that very nice introduction. And uh, I'm feeling slightly embarrassed here. Um, and I'm really happy and honored to be here and give this uh, keynote speech. Uh, and I, when I was asked to do this, I was thinking, let's do something different from what I usually do. Uh, so first I was thinking uh, <coughs> that I should be, I think I am very good at it, and I think we as academics are quite good as, at polemical discussions, criticizing others. We often tend to present our own results in relation to something different, people that do it wrongly, etc. So I was thinking to be a bit more self-critical uh, today. So that's also reflected in the title which is Assumptions and Desires in Scholarship on Gender in Africa, some self-critical reflections. And what I also wanted to do is to shift focus a bit. I think, unfortunately, I missed uh, this uh, conference due to some illness in my family, so I haven't uh, been following it. But often in these types of conferences, we talk about how things are in Africa. Since the theme in this year has been gender. I assume we, talk, we have talked a lot about how gender works in Africa, how gender relations are in Africa, etc. Uh, but I want to do here is to shift the attention away from that question and put it to the attention to ourselves instead as scholars who are producing knowledge about gender subjects in Africa. And I think I'm quite uh, sure that most of us here s sort of subscribe to the idea that knowledge is never objective or neutral, but always shaped by our different positionalities and shifting positional positionalities in terms of gender, sexuality, location, color, uh, privilege, etc. And that's something that has been, especially as we all know, emphasized by feminist uh, research generally, that need for being reflective uh, about your own positionality. And we often do that, I think, in a quite superficial way, uh, sort of stating, in my case, then, that I'm a, a white, heterosexual, uh, middle class or privileged woman. I mean, these kinds of statements we often put in our research, quite superficial, and, but leave it at that. But 
And I want to go a bit further here because I think something that we uh, reflect even less about is our own theoretical and political positions, uh, in this case and in relation to gender and how that shapes uh, research. So simply the questions on our, how our assumptions and desires about what gender is, what it should be, shape the questions that we ask and do not ask and the voices we listen to, but also what we hear and do not hear when we conduct research. And I will exemplify this from my own field in terms of gender, which is on, on war, gender in relation to war and violence. But as I will come back to, I think that these, uh, these divisions and mechanisms are also uh, very evident in relation to other fields like gender and development and so on. But, but maybe they are sharper in this field of war and violence because it's also so, so urgent questions that we're dealing with. And I will start this with two examples. Uh, and the first uh, co example comes from my own research, which has I've been conducted together with Maria Stern and some others as well, uh, since 2005, which has focused on gender masculinities and violence within the Congolese armed forces. So we try to understand uh, how the Congolese armed forces are gendered, how, how militarized masculinities are are constructed and how that is also then connected to different forms of violence, especially uh, sexual violence. And this was done uh, mainly by interviews and later on more anthropological sort of hanging around in certain military units. So this is a background. So my first examples come then from my own research. And one of the first people that I met is, we can call him Makala, I should also say that the person here, the young man here, uh, is not the one that I'm talking about. This is simply an old childhood friend from the Congo since I lived there who happens to be a soldier and he has agreed that I can use his picture. So this is, uh, what I'm saying is, is not connected to, uh, to this person, but I think it's a very good picture. His expression uh, is a very good example of and also similar to the example I will give now of Makala, which we call him. Uh, and he was 22 years the first time uh, that I interviewed him. And he had been uh, fighting in different armed groups since he was 16 and, and then was integrated into the, the National Armed Forces in 2003. And I was very taken aback and moved by his story. Uh, like many others, uh, he did not want to mainly talk about himself as a soldier. I mean, that was what I was interested in because I was interested in militarized masculinities. Uh, but he wanted mainly to talk about himself as a father and as a husband. And here we really emphasized his sense of failure and vulnerabilities. He told me about one child that died because of the, his superiors failed uh, to give the medical support that they are entitled to um, as children of soldiers. He told about, talked about another one who was also very sick at the moment. He talked about his wife and how he felt like a failed husband, that he couldn't provide for the family and that he was afraid that his wife was going uh, to other men in order to make ends meet and feed the children. So it was really a story of, of vulnerability and, and sense of failure. And he also told me, like many others, that he was forcibly recruited back then in, in when he was 16 and there was horrible violence then committed to his family at the same time. But later, maybe a year into the research project when I started more hanging around and, and not just doing this kind of single interviews, uh, I learned that he, and like many others, were actually not forcibly recruited. Uh, he, he, was, he was recruited because of his own will. Uh, and also other parts in his story, I mean, most of this was true in the sense that it's the truth and, and also reflecting very real feelings of, of failure and, and vulnerability and so on. But it became very clear to me that this was a story of uh, a performance of victimacy, of trying to really stage himself as a victim in relation to me. Uh, which. I had not really questioned before, so that made me then ask myself the question, what is it that made me read his story and many other stories so uncritically? And why did I take these stories sort of at face value? Why did I not question them? I'm usually quite a uh, sort of person who questions everything, but I had not really questioned the idea or, or the, the assess what he said and many others that, that they were forcibly recruited, for example. So this is the question, I will come back to this one, but I will first go into my second example. And the second example is the man who allegedly raped 53 women. And 
this example is not from my research, uh, but it's connected to more to my research since I and a colleague heavily criticized this uh, reporting from the BBC. Uh, but even if it's not, if it's a media example, I think it's a good example of what I'm trying to convey here. Uh, in a sense that this reporting was widely shared by many researchers on Twitter, on Facebook, etc., as if it was true, or as if it was a believable story. Uh, and very shortly, this is a reporting from, from Minova, which is when the, the Congolese army was defeated then by the M23, and they were fleeing south and pillaging and committing a lot of violence uh, in the area of Minova. And there was a lot of different violence going on, and also then sexual violence, and uh, slightly more than 100 rapes were reported after these incidents. And in this uh, uh, reporting, you can see a young man who is also very clearly sort of identified as an ex Mai Mai from Shabunda, they are now in the armed forces. He was clearly stoned or under influence of some kind of uh, drug, uh, and he sits there and then saying that he raped these 53 women within less than a day. Uh, this, if you go into this now, you will not see it because it was taken away, but partly because of the criticism, I think. So you can, the, the, the reporting is there, but you cannot see the man saying this anymore. But as it Often the case is sort of been taken out uh, by other media who reported about it. So in the Guardian, for example, you can still uh, read what he what he said. It says here that in a small house on a hill overlooking Lake Kivu, a young Congolese soldier recounts the crimes that he and his comrades committed in Minova a few months ago. Twenty-five of us gathered together and said we should rape ten women each, and we did it. He said, "I raped 53 women and children of five and six years old." I didn't rape because I was angry, but because it gave us a lot of pleasure, says 22-year-old Matteso, not his real name. Uh, <coughs> and I actually checked this also with medical personnel, but it's quite, uh, maybe not impossible unless you, depending on if you go to the extent that you ejaculate or not, but most would say that it's, if you don't have superhuman capacities, it would be impossible to rape 53 women within less than a day. But still, this was then shared widely by even I mean, critical researchers as if this could actually be a true story. Uh, so what then is my point here? Uh, well, I should say my point is absolutely not that people, in this case, many uniform lie. So that's not the point I want to make. Uh, but as a background, of course, this is important. Uh, and, and these two stories do reflect that all testimonies, regardless who the storyteller is, are also performances, uh, which are informed by different interests and, and <coughs> assumptions. And it's also shaped by what the person we interview think that we want to hear from them. Uh, and in that case, these two stories then reflect different kind of assumptions and interests. I would say the story of Makala reflect uh, what uh, Mats Utas and others has been writing about as uh, positionalities of victimacy uh, based on the whole idea that people in war zones can be understood as tactical agents who are engaged in social navigation and, and taking this position of victimacy can then be particularly strategic, especially in relation to external actors and humanitarian actors and can be the only way actually to access some kind of assistance. Uh, and here then I was, of course, seen then as somebody with connections uh, that could possibly help him and his other comrades in, in the army. Uh, well, the other story then of the man who raped 53 women, I would say, reflects the growing uh, role of media in war zones, which Hoffman, among others, have been writing about in relation to Sierra Leone and, and Liberia, where he concludes that to be seen is known to be profitable and becomes an end in itself creating these exaggerated stories. And that's then including also then quenching the thirst for these stories about African uh, brutal savage warriors who are engaged in, in extraordinary violence that we never heard about uh, before. So this is the background before I then turn to ourselves and what we choose to hear and not to hear. Because that's the main question then. <coughs> Why did I initially fail to problematize the testimonies of victimization? 
And why do several researchers take the 53 women rapist story at face value without questioning it? And as I fly for initially, the focus here, my main focus is on our assumptions and politics in relation to gender and feminist theory. Uh, but of course, we cannot just uh, focus on that because one clear answer to this, or one, one uh, aspect which also contributes to answering these questions, is of course the images of Africa. So we cannot take that away, and especially not me, who is also see myself as a post-colonial theorist. So in that sense, I would argue that uh, the way that this 53 rapist woman <coughs> story was taken uh, at face value do reflect these sort of colonial images of African militarized male as over-sexualized, uh, particularly violent and brutal compared to militarized white men. I do s think that people maybe would have been had a more critical position towards this story if it had been a white militarized man. Arguable, but I do think so. Uh, at the same time, I would say that perhaps my initial failure to problematize uh, these very strong uh, <coughs> narratives of victimacy reflected my post-colonial position and the ways in which the stories of Makal and others who were really conveying a sensitive man victimized and the very analytical distinguishing between different forms of violence and explaining things and also very ethical, how that sort of fitted very well into my post-colonial agenda and maybe less critical towards the stories. But let me then move into the question of gender and what we think that gender is. Uh, clearly, the scholarship on gender conflict in Africa is extremely diverse as feminist and gender theory generally. Uh, and I've taken an extremely easy route here uh, to distinguish between two main uh, positions. Uh, one which I call the more policy-oriented and mainstream position and the other, which I then call the po more post-structuralist inspired scholarship to which I uh, belong myself. So what I would do here, and I know it's very different, I know that some of you know gender theory very well, and that some of you do not. Uh, so those who know it very well, uh, bear with me and also excuse me for being so, doing, uh, sort of painting this very simplistic uh, story about this. And for the others, I hope that you, uh, you, you understand what I'm trying to say or how I describe these two positions. So we'll first start with, with saying what I mean by this, what I put in these two categories, and then go into how I think that that shapes uh, how we do research in different ways and come to different conclusions. So if we start with the more policy-oriented or mainstream, I do want to call it. Uh, if it was a Swedish, if I had this talk in Swedish, it would be easier. In, Swe in Swedish, we have uh, what uh, expression for this, which is sort of summarizes it, which is sad arch feminism, and could be uh, termed instead in English as feminism of difference. Uh, but basically, the idea of that there is a fundamental difference between men and women, even if all here also would say the social construct, but still that there is an idea of a fundamental difference and that the difference, this imagined difference, is not the problem in itself. But the problem is the value we put into the feminine and the masculine. So in that sense, the idea here then is men's domination over women are or operating through this devaluation of the feminine attributes, like emotions, carrying women as being peaceful, nonviolent, etc. And the feminist politics is then about upvaluing these uh, uh, these characteristics generally, uh, and which is often then reflected in the quite sort of instrumentalist uh, arguments that women are to be included because they are more peaceful. They are included, for example, in peacekeeping operations because they're more peaceful and will also regulate the violence committed by the male, the male soldiers or male colleagues around them, etc. And I would say this very, uh, and as other researchers also pointed out, this, this is very strong in the. Uh, uh, pe women, peace and security and the Security Council Resolution 1325 and the work around that, this idea of, of, of the, that the problem is not the difference itself, it's the how we value it and we need to upvalue the, the associations around femininity. And this then is in contrast to what I hear then call the post-structuralist uh, inspired scholarship which in Swedish then could be also uh, uh, defined as likhets feminism or the feminism of similarity. 
So this is more guided by that the, there is a fundamental similarity or the, the variation between genders are bigger than, the, than between the two categories and really emphasizing that gender is constructed by discourse and even the body is constructed through discourse. And that there is actually the idea of difference itself that's the problem. The continuous construction <coughs> of the idea that there is a difference between men and women and the associations we put to that. So here the feminist politics then is about deconstructing these uh, different positions and, and, and show how, how they work in different ways. And this is building generally on, on, on post-structuralist post theorization. And here I have a citation for Derrida, and you can also have it in a post-colonial setting, of course, and, 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 and have Africa versus Europe, etc. But the idea that we're not never dealing with peaceful coexistence of a vis-a-vis, -vis or women vis-a-vis -vis men, but rather violent hierarchy where one of the two terms governs the other or has the upper hand. Does this uh, make sense? This character of two different positions? Hope so, I'll, otherwise we can go back to it. Uh, so then what I want to propose here then is that these different positions make us do research in different ways, come to different conclusions, and that we just we tend to hear some voices and not others. So I will start then with how I think, uh, and this is not rocket science, I'm sure you already assumed what I'm coming to here, uh, but, <coughs> but how that <coughs> shapes what I would say then, then more policy-oriented mainstream research on this issue. I mean, one thing, and this has been emphasized a lot, that in this kind of research, uh, you rarely engage with masculinity or men at all. And even often when you actually read things that are branded as gender, what's, what it's really about is about women. This is women's experience, of women's voices, etc. Uh, but here, and given what I said before, there is I mean, a certain stake in maintaining the old story about gender and war, in which uh, B uh, men are seen as the perpetrators and women as the victims. Uh, <coughs> leading then, so I would say, a certain reluctance to recognize men as victims of war and violence. I'm quite sure that uh, uh, research with different feminist uh, inclination than I had would, for example, read uh, Makala's testimonies in a much more critical way than I did. I'm quite sure. And that that would be also perhaps interpreted in terms of, uh, of, of uh, masking, or that was not really how it is, and, and, and so on. It would be a much more critical reading, I think. Uh, but also, I would say, read a quite uncritical position towards women's stories of victimhood. Here again, I think the Congo is quite a good example. Uh, as we've been writing about also in the books and also others uh, before and after us, uh, in the Congo there was a quite sort of singular focus on sexual violence compared to other violence. So, so sexual violence was the kind of violence which was seen as particularly harmful and bad and that we need to do something about, which was also reflected in how the funding went into the Congo. So you had earmarked funding to victims of sexual violence, for example. Uh, which then led to a quite natural situation uh, in that women had to, almost had to, present themselves as victims of rape in order to access basic health and other needs. That was a way to actually survive in this context, uh, to, to have this victimacy position. So this is something that we wrote about and, and also others, but it was extremely difficult in some corners to actually accept this. And this, I think, part of I me mean, reflects a lot of different things, but partly reflects this sort of quite uncritical position and really not willing to sort of think about the idea that, that these, uh, this happens and, and that we also need to question sometimes the women's stories of victimhood. Uh, <coughs> but as I said in the beginning, I don't want to be po polemical. That's not the idea with this talk. Uh, so try to be self-critical. Uh, so in that sense then, of course, the position which I research from myself is also has its problems. And here, I mean, given the idea that it's a construction, the idea of difference, that's the problem, uh, we are here then driven by a wish to pr problematize the common accepted stories about gender and war. The idea of men being the perp always the perpetrators and women the victims, etc. And part of this, and I will not go back to b into this, but as we have done research about, is also to, to look into the multiple expressions of militarized masculinities and that don't look always the same 
in every context and not always involves a rejection of all feminine attributes that we tend to think. I mean, that's one of the conclusions from our research on, um, in the Congo on the Congolese army. But then also then, uh, driven by this wish then to also highlight women's violence, what they do in war, and also then show women or, or show the ways and also men are victims of war. And this then results as the example of Makala shows, uh, that's inten the intention with that, with that uh, example. Uh, Rich that would then have this quite uncritical position to man's stories of victimhood, which I had. Uh, I think that his story and many of the other stories, they fitted so well with what we wanted to see that we took it quite uncritically. So in combination with our gender or feminist theory standpoint, together with the post-colonial, it's so contributed to this quite uncritical reading of it, and that it took quite some time for me before I actually realized that some of the more factual accounts they're telling me are actually not reflecting any, anything that actually happened. Uh, but there are also other uh, examples, uh, or another risk, uh, the risk of having an uncritical position towards testimonies of women as perpetrators. And here to take a more concrete example from my own research, which I've been reflecting a bit upon, is a study uh, which was highly, it was published in a highly reputable, rank, high-ranking journal. So, so, so objectively, from a sort of academic standpoint, there was really sort of a high-quality uh, product. Uh, it was published in a journal of the American Medical Association. Uh, <coughs> but still, there was something really strange with this study. But anyway, so the main conclusion and, and why I think that, w w that I have actually cited it, even if I think it's extremely problematic, is that they say that 40% that of the uh, female victims of sexual violence reported, uh, or 40% so allegedly were, of the sexual violence was committed by fem female combatants, and 10 when it came to male victims, which doesn't make sense. Because the, the, the proportion of female combatants in, in most armed groups in the Congo are less than 10%. So unless these women are particularly, particularly violent, which is of course possible, but, but still a bit unlikely, uh, there's something that doesn't go together with stu this study, which also was a large-scale uh, survey. And there are also other problems with it. I mean, the proportion of civilians were very low compared to all other reports coming out. The proportion of the, the sexual violence committed by the Congolese armed forces was very low. So there's something fundamentally wrong with this study, probably uh, then in relation to how it was conducted, this survey was conducted. But still, I've cited it many times, o often with sort of a disclaimer, at least in the footnote, that this is a problematic study, has a lot of problems in it, but I have still cited it, which I do not think. I mean, I would never cite it in the context of saying that uh, the sexual violence by the Congolese army has gone down, for example, because I have no stake in that. There's nothing in me for doing that. It's not connected to any of my desires as a researcher. But this particular thing, because it's the only more quantitative study that actually has tried to say something about f uh, female combatants and violence in the Congo. So, this is one example of it. Uh, how I think that, then in, in, in our case, in my case, in our case, how are different positions shape uh, the research that we conduct? also in relation to what other kinds of studies we uh, refer to. Uh, I will not say more about this. Uh, I have two sort of more uh, things I would like to bring up before uh, for wrapping up. And one is, of course, an issue that, uh, the question that comes up in this context is if there's something particularly Western or Northern about these positions, or if any of them is more or less African than the other, in terms of, I mean, is, I mean, some would claim, and I know that some feminist positions would claim that the more post-structuralist post inspired scholarship is particularly Western, ethnocentric, and so on. Uh, so I know there's a debate of this, uh, <coughs> so I would leave this as an open question. In my ex reading, it's not. I would say there are as many feminisms uh, in Africa as in Europe. Uh, so in that sense, I also say that, that what I've been talking about today, these different feminist positions, they shape how we do research, whether we're based in Europe or in Africa. So it's more, uh, more general. But I keep that as an open question. Maybe that's also something that, that you would like to 
uh, reflect more upon Angela. And then to come back to the question before, because now we've, I've been talking within my own area of gender violence and conflict. Uh, but as I said in the beginning, I mean, these positions uh, and the mechanisms that I've been talking about does also apply in other areas. For example, even if I would say that they're probably less, because it's less at stake, in, in or less at stake, because you can also <laughs> you can ask what I mean by that. But, uh, but for example, in relation to gender and development, uh, this is quite an old citation uh, from 2000, Andrea Cornwall. Uh, so things have happened, but still, this is how she summarizes it in relation to, to the gender and development uh, discourse. That men in all their diversity are largely <coughs> missing from representations of gender issues and gender relations in God, gender and development. It's God. Mainstream development pervades its own set of stereotypical images of men serving equally to miss the variety of men who occupy other more marginal positions in households and communities. Portrayed and engaged with only in relation to women, men are presumed to be powerful and are represented as problematic obstacles to equitable development. Men's experiences of powerlessness remain outside the frame of God, so threatening is the idea of the marginal man. So this is um, just, I think, a lot has happened in, in relation to gender and development since this. There's much more focus on on masculinity is so much more recognition of what happens to traditional masculine roles in development processes, etc. So something has happened, but still, this is a reflection of that these positions are also not just something that is it's, uh, that we can see in relation to gender and conflict and violence. So, let me start to wrap up. Uh, I, I do think, and I always thought it was that it's important that I have to try to do here to sort of shift the focus to ourselves and be more uh, self-critical. Uh, As I said <coughs> in the beginning, uh, we have uh, at least most who do research within feminist or gender uh, gender areas have this sort of or, or emphasize this importance of positionality and also reflecting upon this positionality. And as I said, we often tend to do that, at least in a superficial way, stating uh, our color, uh, uh, gender, etc. But what we're more really engaged, and that's what I wanted to, to have this talk, is how, how different theoretical and political positions shape it. I think that's something that we much more rarely actually discuss. What we rather do is then pointing out the problems of, of, of others. Uh, so, and that's also why I chose to have a non sort of polemical, even if I'm sure that maybe I sound much more critical uh, in when I talk to one position than the other, that, that's, that's possible. Uh, but still, I chose to not have this more sort of polemical uh, discussion because I, I do think uh, that engaging in this discussion, that for me and others who, who do so, uh, <coughs> that it is crucial. Uh, not just because we, this is also a part of the need to be reflexive and, and about our different positionalities. It's not just about these other also very important issues, but also about more sort of theoretical and political agendas that we have. Uh, and then to, with the aim of to ultimately then, if we are more self-critical and reflecting upon this, also then hopefully producing better knowledge in the end of it. Um, this is what I want to say. Thank you. So I will invite Angela to discuss and make some. Uh, yes. Oh, you So thank you uh, very much, Maria. And uh, thank you for the very, very generous, too generous in, uh, uh, introduction, Chair. Um, I have many, many questions and comments. Uh, and my, my uh, task as a discussant is a little bit difficult because you've already kind of uh, 
covered a lot of the territory I, I wanted to, to ask you more about. Um, so let me, just, let me just start by saying that I really appreciate this opening. Um, I do research you know, on sexual violence in armed conflict. Is it me that's doing that? No. Okay. Can you hear me? This is okay if I stay this far away. So, um, there are a couple of things that, that I, I would like to just sort of say I think are really helpful about this conversation. The first is that if I want to be a bit of a of a sort of reactionary person, I, I could argue that uh, the, the, the call to be more self-critical, especially when related to uh, war and sexual violence, um, seems a little bit unfair, uh, given that there will be only, there'll be some scholars that are self-critical and others that are not, and that that creates um, kind of imbalance. If you think about the way in which many people have used this topic um, and policymakers have used this, this topic to uh, uh, mobilize for resources and political attention, to securitize sexual violence, to uh, uh, um, exaggerate and amplify and make more grotesque the sexual violence that happens, like the 53 men, there has been a kind of a, a, a rationale behind that. Um, uh, and that rationale has been to raise public awareness, attention, to, to uh, claim space for, for women, and, the, and to claim space uh, for victims of sexual violence. And I think that, that some of the, some of the um, um, kind of defen defensiveness of policymakers that you've encountered, that I know I've encountered, I'm aware of, is around that, that they say, well, we have to do this in order to, 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 to really raise attention to this really big problem that's been ignored for, for, for forever. Um, but I, I, I still think what you're doing, because you're trying not to be polemical, is, is important. So I wish that you could you'd have an, op an opportunity to have this conversation with those very policymakers. Um, the, the, uh, the other side of this uh, is that you're asking us to, as researchers, to be more accountable in a way to ourselves and to, and to, our, our, to, to our students, to our, our publics. Um, to use the I more, uh, and that is uncomfortable. Uh, it's extremely uh, uncomfortable when we talk about things like sexual violence, which I think many researchers have in entered into in a way because it has such an intimate bearing on their own uh, experience and storylines, their own personal narratives and backgrounds. So if we go to your African feminists, Western feminists, I agree with you, Maria, that there are so many multiple feminisms on both sides. Um, but I do think that uh, in some respects that the, uh, it's very difficult to do this because one doesn't want to essentialize everything and everyone. Um, but from a sort of an African feminist position, um, there's this kind of, um, fear that we will cede territory that's been hard fought to bring this, this topic and these issues into sort of more mainstream uh, rooms and conferences. Um, as a positivist researcher, that's, that's a fear I have because it's extremely important that we now, in, very, in a very limited amount of time, have more and more space to explore issues around um, gender-based violence or issues around gender at all in uh, mainstream international relations or political science. Um, and 
uh, yeah, so that's that's a kind of reflection I want to have. But I don't I don't think it's it's I think it's exciting in a way. Uh, um, and then if we're going to talk about the the I, I'll say that you know. I think for some African feminist scholars working on war and sexual violence, that there is an increasing interest in what you call this perpetrator storyline. Um, so in the telling the story of perpetrators from their, their perspective, partly because of the, the problem of the way in which uh, Africans have been dehumanized, uh, right, in, on the other side of it. And we've talked about this in other, throughout the, the couple of days. But with regards to wartime sexual violence, I, I, I've been particularly interested in the fact that there are other storylines of, of, of organizations that don't commit sexual violence widely. And that for every guy who's known to have raped many, many women, there may be five or six who've not raped any. So uh, I, I think it would be very interesting. It's, it, it, this conversation and the whole sort of way in which this sub sub field is, um, is evolving is opening up for these other storylines. And I think that's <coughs> very important. Um, the lazy scholar in me says, to some extent, these tensions and these traps that you've brought up are, um, they're okay, that we have to kind of learn to live with them and rather uh, try to be more transparent, but we have to live with them because it's impossible for any one story to be completely, to be complete. That is, there's an there's a inherent incompleteness um, in our research and whatever tradition you, you're, you're, you're coming to. So there needs to be some acceptance of multivocality. And also that in being more comfortable with, the, with this kind of incompleteness that we should um, try to sort of genuinely de develop uh, more opportunities for collaboration, not, not, not this sort of fuzzy sort of collaboration, but r much more uh, genuine uh, collaboration between, because that's the only way that we, we can get, we can go to the ever impossible infinite end of, of completing these stories with different perspectives. So I have um, just a few questions. <laughs> um, I, I wondered if you could help us think about how you could teach this self-criticism. What kind of questions you would, I mean, you've, you've raised the questions already, but how do you teach it? Because a, one of the challenges is that there is a, there is a again, I'm, I'm worried about being self-critical, some being self-critical and others not being self-critical. Um, and I'm also um, aware that, you know, I, 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 I do believe there are, there are some facts that exist. Um, and that's just, that's the tradition I, I, I inhabit. But how I can teach a methodology for trying to get at some of those facts. But how do you teach this self-criticism. Um, I also want to sort of w make one challenge to you about uh, victimology, because I know that inherent in, in your own self-criticism is this idea that it's, you don't want to turn perpetrators into victims, um, to let them off the hook, to undermine your own feminist uh, principles. Uh, but I think that there's, there's the other side of it, which is that if you, that we know, or we, we know that through so, so social psychology that one of the kind of missing pieces for victims is for their healing is to know the truth, to know why 
why they why something happened. And my challenge is a kind of I I think that hearing from perpetrators, um, maybe they will lie, but getting at that, you know, cumulatively, systematically, in a in a in a in a kind of dogged fashion, getting at the, at that story from the perpetrator's perspective is important for victims too, for their healing. Um, and it, it fills a very important and genuine gap. So that's it for me. Yeah, we are gradually getting there. How do we teach a separate citizen as part of our methodological requirement when we get to the field or when we are trying to relate with the policy maker. And of course, uh, there is a new emerging trend, the entrepreneur angle is of interest to me. I think uh, maybe before we open the floor, you want to quickly address that, yeah. then we open the Q&A session. Thank you so much, Angela. Good, good reflections. Uh, and I agree with that. Maybe I should just also really emphasize that this talk is very, is very much directed to us as academics and nothing that I would, uh, so in that sense, uh, no, this is not probably nothing that I would sort of uh, talk about in relation to the more mainstream uh, feminist or the more policy world, because uh, I'm sure they will be very happy, given all the conflicts I had with the policy world in relation to sexual violence, I'm quite happy that they will be very, uh, I'm sure that they will be very happy and use this as Okay, see, their research is not good enough. That's what we always said, you know. So this is very much sort of a, an academic uh, debate here. So I would never uh, actually uh, say this in front of Margot Wallström, for example, <laughs> who I had a lot of discussions with. Um, but again, I mean, as, as I emphasize, I mean, these are not easy questions. And also, having had so many debates with a more sort of policy-oriented world in relation to this, we also see that, that, that these are politically important issues. I mean, the whole the whole description of rape as a weapon of war has been instru fundamentally instrumental in order to bring up the issue of sexual violence so high up <coughs> on the agenda. Because it's by saying that this is inevitable, this is something that you can control in a similar way as you control other weapons, then also, I mean, other politicians get engaged in this by this very simple story. And of course, I understand that that the policy world then get very upset when we and others have saying, no, it's actually, most of the time, it's not actually strategic. And it's not just me and Marie, and also, but also many uh, Woods and others. So the mainstream now in research will say that no, it's not. Uh, it, it's not ordered. So it's, it's much more complicated than that. But I understand the political side, um, and also the, the fear that many have that okay, if we now acknowledge men as victims, will they now take over that agenda again? I mean, the the whole history of war has been the history of men or men, 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 and now we have finally have women in as victims. And shall will the men take this? position as well then and dominates sort of the victim debate. So I totally see that these are, I mean, very delicate and, and, and difficult questions. And, and actually, after having these debates so much with the policy world, and I also kind of, when it comes to the issue of, of the more instrumentalist argument on women in armed forces or women in peacekeeping, I mean, that is how you co convince high generals up in, in NATO and, and, and et cetera. That's how you convince them. They, d they don't care about women's equal rights. But if, if you can convince them, if you have buy more women in your armed forces, your, your forces will be more effective. Because they will talk to the women, they will get other kinds of information. I mean, by driving this argument, you do get women in. So I totally understand that part. And so, so shortly, just so I've come to make the conclusion that, that it's fine. No? They, they, the, the policy world can talk about it in this way. They can do that. They can, they can say these quite untrue things about what sexual violence is in war and, and these quite untrue essentialistic things about how women are, etc. Maybe it's worth it. But within our academic debates, it's a different thing. So, um, and on how to teach it, um, it's difficult. I think the, the only way to teach it is actually by looking into one's own and others' experiences. So it's only by retelling these stories about your own reflections and doing that loudly rather than just keeping it in your head. Uh, that you can actually also sort of encourage that and also <coughs> students to be more re reflective. And I would say that this, the anthropologists would like this, uh, a better methodology. I mean, I, I'm quite always critical to these kind of surveys or 
one encounter interviews because you, you don't you don't get much from that. So so definitely a much better methodology. And, and because I do think also it has it does create problems, and we can see that in relation to also sexual violence and whether uh, it is a weapon of war or not. I mean, we started up in the Congo. Nobody said uh, the, the soldiers that we interviewed that they'd ever been ordered to do it. But recent research coming out from the Congo says that a lot, a lot of combatants saying they were ordered. But the thing is now that discourse of rape as a weapon of war is so widespread, not just here, but also in the Congo. The soldiers or the combatants know that this is how it's described, because that's in all the reporting about it. So, so it also makes it difficult, how, how does that actually say something about it or not? You know? so, so, so generally, yeah, and more, a better methodology where you can actually spend more time with people. Well, I'm not an anthropologist, but maybe I would like to be. <laughs>